So if we reject the law, it's the same as rejecting the Son. The rejection of the Son is the same as the rejection of the Father. We are on the very verge of the final conflict, and the world needs to be warned. This movement is not to form separate congregations. This movement is to infuse all. So the world is seeing revolt. Well, who's engineering these events? It's not just happening in the Arab world. It's happening in Europe. It's going to come here. People are fed up with everything that's going on in this world. And this is the breach that needs to be repaired in the time that we live in. We can study prophecies, we can know what's happening in the world, we can see all of these things. If we don't start right here with Jesus, we've gone nowhere. In part one of Reaping the Whirlwind, we took a look at all the societies that fall under Roman Catholicism and how they have infiltrated the echelons of power. And we looked at many examples, or some examples at least, in the first part. And we saw that the Knights of Malta, that the founding leaders of the CIA, the FBI, they were all Knights of Malta people. And we also looked at Opus Dei to some extent. And then we also looked at the Bilderbergers. Tonight we want to continue with the Bilderbergers in Reaping the Whirlwind Part 2. And we'll look at some of the other organizations. Psalm 77 verse 18, the voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world, the earth trembled and shook. And we discussed this point that the two forces in the world, the two powers, are reaching a point of climax. Now, if we want to look at the Bilderbergers, we have to ask ourselves the question, if they are a powerful think tank, then where do they come from and what is the power behind the power? And this is fascinating. This is an extract from His Royal Highness Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, an authorized biography by Alden Hatch. And it comes directly off the Bilderberg webpage. So it's always good to go to the source and get it from the horse's mouth, how these things started. Prince Bernard of the Netherlands was the first front man for this organization. And this is what it says. At a small hotel near Arnhem in the deeply wooded uplands of Eastern Holland, in 1954, a group of eminent statesmen, financiers, intellectuals from the principal nations of Europe and the United States met together in perhaps the most unusual international conference ever held until then. Now, please note that this is the authorized biography, and it comes directly from their own web page. There was absolutely no publicity. The hotel was ringed by security guards, so not a single journalist got within a mile of the place. The participants were pledged not to repeat publicly what was said in the discussions. Every person present, prime ministers, foreign ministers, leaders of political parties, heads of great banks, industrial companies, representatives of such international organizations as the European Coal and Steel Community, as well as academicians, was magically stripped of his office as he entered the door and he became a simple citizen of his country for the duration of the conference. Thus everybody could and did say what he really thought without fear of international, political or financial repercussions. So the idea is created that this is a form of think tank, but surely it must lead somewhere. 
That meeting and the subsequent ones that stemmed from it, which have had a great if indefinite impact on the history of our times, are perhaps, in this writer's opinion, Prince Bernard's proudest achievement in the field of Western unity and international amity. Now, he was the front man. Here was the royal, a man of stature. People could look up to him. The great industrialists were involved, the great politicians of the time, and uh, kings and queens and others. Now, it says here in this very autobiography, it was not Bernhard's original idea. Well, whose was it then? But had its inception in the brilliant brain of Dr. Josef H. Rettinger. Rettinger was an extraordinary character who flitted through Europe talking on intimate terms with prime ministers, labor leaders, industrial magnates, revolutionaries, intellectuals. In short, all the non-communist rulers and would-be rulers of the free nations of Europe. Though the people persist in calling Rettinger an 18th century man functioning in the 20th century, he was not that at all. He came straight out of the Renaissance instead of the skeptical, precious attitude typical of the 18th century. He is what? Straight out of the autobiography, the authorized one. His Jesuitical conviction that the end justified the means and a Borgian aptitude for intrigue, but the ends he sought were never selfish, they were good. Though his name is virtually unknown except to the, what? Initiates. He made more history in his secret way than many a man who moved to the sound of the trumpet and the howl of motorcycle sirens. So this is the power behind the power. According to official publication of the European Center of Culture, Rettinger was the key figure in most of the great European Union. The League of European Economic Cooperation from which evolved the common market, the European movement, the European Center of Culture would not have seen light without him. So who is behind the unification of Europe? Rome, the Jesuits. And what does the Jesuit oath say? That it swears absolute allegiance to the Pope, that they will do anything, waste, boil, flay. You, you know the story, it's in previous lectures. Absolute obedience, perinde a cadaver, like a corpse. No will of their own. And the papacy has to be reinstated. Ultra Montanism, all power in one man. This is the aim. So if you look at the aim and you see the people involved, then you must know that everything you see that seems contrary to this aim must be a smokescreen. The Congress of Europe at The Hague was his doing. And the Council of Europe grew out of that, being above all a realist. Rettinger understood that even a united Europe could not stand by itself without America. So you have the beast out of the sea, and you have the beast out of the earth. This is biblical. We're on the right track. Thank you for the Bilderberg webpage. This is Josef Hieronym Rettinger. He died in 1960. He has one of the famous pictures of him with Vladislav Sikorsky and uh, Prime Minister, Polish Prime Minister General. And then we have this interesting collaboration or additional information. This comes from Germany, and it's in German, and it says here in, in, in German, what does the European Union and the Jesuits, what do they have in common with each other? What have they to do with each other? And how do the Bilderbergers fit into the picture? And then it mentions a book here, Drahtzieher der Macht, that's 
the ones pulling the strings behind the seats of power. That's the name of the book. And the author is Gerhard Wisniewski, who is a political scientist and a free journalist. And he wrote this book. And it talks about what these people did. The European League of Economic of economic cooperation, the general secretary, was the Jesuit Joseph Hieronym Rettinger. And thereby, we can see who the real founders of the European Union are. It talks about the American Committee for a United Europe. And who was behind that? The same man. So the Jesuits were active on both sides of the Atlantic. Of course, he also knew Rockefeller, who financed the movement. And Rockefeller seems to be a part of this founding of the European Union. But who was the man behind the scenes who pulled the strings like the puppet man. This man was the friend of Rockefeller, and this was Josef Hieronym Rettinger, the Jesuit. So there are a number of sources. So let's have a look at Europe and see how it's coming together. Because the Bible says that the ten horns are ten kings that will give their power unto the beast. Now this can be the universal ten regions, but it also must be a direct reference to the ten-horned beast of Daniel chapter 7, which was the Roman Empire of which the Roman Catholic Church is the heir. Such would be the fulfillment of a Sunday Telegraph article, 21 July 1991, which stated Karol stated Vaitola, is calmly preparing to assume the mantle which he solemnly believes to be his divine rights. This was still in the time of John Paul II. That a new holy Roman emperor reigning from the Urals to the Atlantic, the Catholic Church is achieving this through its political wing, the Christian Democrat and Christian Socialist parties. They rule Europe with the EU's founding fathers now reaping the ultimate reward, sainthood. The Pope has beatified de Gasperi, Schumann, and Adenauer. These were the great leaders of the power bloc nations for founding the Union on Roman Catholic principles. And although the world believes today that Europe is founded on purely secular principles, we see that in actual fact, behind the scenes, it is founded on Roman Catholic principles. But the battle is for the mind. The mindset of man has to be pushed and coerced into position to accept this, so that finally, when the kings of the world give their power unto the beast, the populace will say, yay and amen, and prophecy will be fulfilled. A supporter of their canonization said it shows that Europe was built upon a rock. I'm glad they managed to write it with a small R and not a capital. Adding, I think that the European Union is a design not only of human beings, but of God. The very act of bestowing sainthoods on politicians is purposely designed to inculcate that European unification is God's will and that those who lead it govern by divine rights. This is interesting stuff. So here are the saints that Pope John Paul put on the road to sainthood. Alcide de Gasperi, Italian statesman, politician, founder of the Christian Democratic Party. And from 1945 to 53, he was the prime minister of eight successive coalition governments. A conservative Catholic, he was one of the founding fathers of the European Union. Along with a Frenchman, so it's Italy, France, 
Robert Schumann, and the German Konrad Adenauer. And where is he buried? He's buried in the Basilica di San Lorenzo, etc., a basilica in Rome. And his beatification process opened in 1993. They're making saints of the politicians. Isn't that marvelous? You'll be able to pray to this man and get some merit for what he did. There's Robert Schumann, French pronunciation. I don't know, I'm not French. Was a noted Luxembourgish born French statement. Was a what? A Christian Democrat, an independent political thinker and activist, twice Prime Minister of France. The same thing, active in the founding of the European Union and the Council of Europe and NATO. So behind the scenes, Roman power is moving the world into its trap. Konrad Adenauer, he was Chancellor of Germany in the post-war years and he led his country from the ruins of the war to a powerful and prosperous nation. Well, he is now a saint. He patched up the feelings with France and uh, he is also the first leader of the Christian Democratic Union, a coalition of Catholics and Protestants. And they remain dominant to this day. So this is the European Union and the think tank tanks that tackle the issues of the world are founded on Jesuitical principles and founded by the Jesuits. So this is history. This is not conspiracy. This is Fox News. The Vatican says the world's finances, financial troubles show the need for religion in politics. So now he's making his moves to get the world to accept his moral voice. Vaticanisto News. Papst spricht vor dem Bundestag. So he's speaking before, the Pope is speaking before the German Parliament. And here he appeared with great applause. Now what did he have to say? This is all fascinating stuff. In his speech that was awaited with great excitement, the Pope had some interesting things to say. He asked for the politics to be involved in gerechtigkeit, righteousness and peace. And he asked that the foundations for a free state under law should be laid. A free, a state of freedom. Here he is greeted at that meeting and here he takes his seat in the Parliament of Germany and he is going to address the nation. Outside there were a few protests and people thought this is not right because church and state is separated but they don't know the constitutions and how they have been set up behind the scenes. And then he took his stand and he made an interesting speech which to the ordinary ear might sound innocuous, unimportant. He said, as Pope and Bishop of Rome, and as the top uh, person in the Catholic Church, or the one who carries the responsibility, you are now recognizing my role of that of my uh, holy chair as partner within the state community, the community of states. So here, the fact that I stand before this parliament, you are recognizing my role as the head of the Roman Catholic Church, not only to be a church leader, but a partner in state politics. This is an interesting statement. And from my international responsibility, I would like to share some ideas with you about the basis about a state, a free state under law. 
And then he says, take away all law, and the state becomes a system of robbers. So you need law, but you need a law guided by certain principles. Now, what are those principles? The wording is incredibly complicated. And uh, one has to understand Roman Catholic thinking in order to unravel what this man is saying. So for the development of this state under law, uh, it was necessary in the past for Christian theolog theologians to take their stand against the general uh, pagan, if I can put it that way, how shall I put this, the general pagan systems that had been placed in systems of government. And we want to put ourselves on the side of a philosophy that is based on reason and nature. Now you must understand Roman Catholic law. It is based on natural law and not based on the Bible or on the principles of the Bible. Because natural law says that any law that is sub or is applicable in an area must be applicable anywhere in the world and that this law must be based on reason whose reason the vatican's reason and therefore the vatican's reasoning must become universal law not based on righteousness or biblical principles but based on the reason which, according to Roman Catholic theology, is unfallen. This is exactly the opposite of what Protestantism taught, namely that we are fallen beings and that our reason must be subject to divine decrees. So here we have a fascinating statement. He is asking, basically, for the legislature to consider laws that are in harmony with this Catholic principle. And if they do, then he is the morality behind all legislation. Fascinating statements. After that, he met with the Protestants. And what did he do? He snubbed them. He treated them as little children. And uh, they were very upset. They said it was an insult the way he treated them. He praised the ecumenical movement, but uh, he said faith, meaning Catholic faith, is not negotiable. You see, they do not see eye to eye regarding the mass or those issues. But he went along and he met them at the place where Martin Luther did much of his work. And they said here that his, his way of working with the Pro Protestants was sensational. But he was even condescending towards them. Someone who acts like this knows that the power is his. He has it in the bag. And then to demonstrate this power, after having spoken in the parliament, told them on what basis their legislations must be based, having snubbed the Protestants by telling them that faith, Catholic faith, is not negotiable, negotiable, but ecumenism must continue nevertheless. He then makes a public appearance before thousands, a hundred thousand people, to demonstrate to the nation his popularity. He says Germany has been through two godless dictatorships in the past, and the time to consider faith had come. These are interesting points. Interesting points. And here is his visit to the place where Martin Luther actually lived and he, he did make a little overture he did say that Martin Luther was a great God seeker but he didn't say he was right or that he was wrong and then he said the mass 
in the monastery of St. Augustine together with Protestants, and here we have pictures of what he did. And the next move is to meet the Muslim world. And so he met with professors of Islamic studies, and they exchanged cordial words. So what is he doing? He's coming from Rome. He's showing his stature and his power. He's looking at his offspring, the Protestants, and telling them what their place is. He embraces Islam. And then he goes to the stadium to say another mass in the Olympic Stadium. So he's showing his power. This is a show of strength. Now, how far is Europe going to go? Cameron says, Euro needs single government. This is interesting, Reuters. So the Euro is experiencing tremendous problems. And nation of the nation is wobbling on the verge of economic collapse. And they say they cannot stay in the euro because they cannot afford it, but they cannot be outside of the euro because then they will face economic isolation. So the nations like Greece and Portugal and Spain and Italy and those that are battling, except the rich, even France is battling. How will they cope with this issue? Why are they allowing this? And we discussed this. Is this a controlled collapse of the euro? I believe it is. I believe it is a controlled collapse of the euro that nations will realize they cannot stay in the euro, but they cannot stay out of it as well. So the only solution to survive is to give up sovereignty. So the next move would be a political compromise and a political union much on the same basis as we have in the United States of America. Then each nation does not have to be economically independent and raise its own funds, but they will have relinquished power to a central body, and that central body will then distribute funds as all the nations require. But they will no longer have sovereignty as they had before. So the controlled collapse of the euro is to lead to this economic union. Now the Bible says they will not cleave one unto another. But it also says that for one hour, for a little while, they will give their power unto the beast. And when they give this power unto the beast, then the final collapse will come. So this is fascinating. Cameron says, Euro needs single government. These are the first words. A successful Eurozone requires a single government. If it is to work properly, British Prime Minister David Cameron said, in a newspaper interview on Wednesday. I found it fascinating that this country, right at the beginning, stayed out of the euro. Isn't it fascinating that these people who are working in their secret echelons already know the plans well in advance? And London is the hub of Jesuitical power. It is a sovereign state within a state, and it belongs to the crown, as we said in a previous lecture, and that crown is ceded to the Pope, politically, historically. So they knew. There's nowhere in the world that has a single currency without having more of a single government, Cameron told Britain's Daily Mail. Making sense of the euro for me would mean that those eurozone countries would have to have much more coordinated economic policy, much more coordinated debt policy, he said. And they express said, Ye EU plot to scrap Britain? Senior Eurocrats are secretly plotting to create a super powerful EU president 
to realize their dream of abolishing Britain, we can reveal. So these nations are beginning to feel, whoa, we're going to lose our sovereignty in this. And I've got news for them. They're going to lose it. A covert group of EU foreign ministers has drawn up plans for merging the jobs currently held by the President of the European Council and the President of the European Commission. And when that job is merged, then you have basically an emperor. We're back to the Middle Ages. Opponents fear the plan could create a modern-day equivalent of the European emperor envisaged by Napoleon Bonaparte. Excuse me, what did he belong to? Wasn't he in a fraternity as well? Wasn't he part of that think tank that was set up under secret societies when the king of the south pushed against the king of the north? They are concerned that David Cameron's coalition government is doing nothing to prevent the sinister plot. The secret talks were uncovered independent by independent Labour peer Lord Stoddart of Swindon. This is a plot by people who want to abolish nation states and create a United States of Europe. He said, the whole thing is balmy. These people are determined to achieve their final objectives. Euro MP Paul Nuttall of the UK Independence Party said, this is a truly ridiculous idea that must never be allowed to happen. It sounds as if they are trying to go back to the days of the Holy Roman Emperor. I have news for him, them. The show of power that the Pope just demonstrated in Europe and the arrogance of his movements there demonstrate he has it in the bag. <laughs> and yet, there are people in this world, and particularly theologians, who do not wish to see the connections and they claim that the papacy is not the Antichrist that the reformers said he was, nor is there any behind the scenes movement to gather the world into his net. I believe these theologians are ostrich theologians and their heads are in the sand. Here's an interesting article and I picked it up and it's written by Adrian Hilton. We'll see who that is in a moment. And he says, render unto the Pope. And he writes, now this is fascinating. These are stones crying out. This is not even a theologian. He doesn't even know what the Bible says on this issue. But just listen to what the man writes. There is much debate, debate about whether the EU is a democracy, a theocracy, a oligarchy or a collective dictatorship, but at root it is none of these. It is an amphitheony, a confederation of states established around a religious center. Isn't that interesting? A Catholic EU will inevitably result in the subjugation of Britain's Protestant ethos to Roman Catholic social, political, and religious teachings. That's natural law. That's what the Pope said, not only in the German Bundestag, but that is what he said in his speech at the United Nations, where he said Roman Catholic law is based on natural law. This man here, of course, is concerned about the fact that if this now happens, then British Protestantism will be toothless. It will have lost its power. But I have news for it, it has lost its power anyway. The Archbishop of Canterbury kneels down and kisses the ring of the Pope when he's supposed to be subject to the Queen. The Queen's coronation oath to govern the peoples of the United Kingdom according to their laws and customs and to maintain the Protestant Reformed religion established by law is negated by the process of deeper European integration. This is the final eradication of the Protestant mindset. But there's good news too, because God has a counter message and people will be forced to make a choice. 
And you either come out of her and stand on God's side, or you stand on the side of this power. Under the constitution of Europe, the EU will have a Catholic Caesar presiding over the Protestant monarch. Accession to the constitution for Europe would finally confirm that the United Kingdom yields to the suzerain European ecumenical community, an empire in which everything belongs to Caesar and where Caesar is God. Rendering the euro unto him would be all that remains for this vassal state to perform. And the writer is Adrian Hilton, a former parliamentary candidate and author of The Principality and Power of Europe. He teaches philosophy and religious studies. He is an approved candidate for the Conservative Party. Interesting. Interesting. Well, there is the Pope, and here are his power agents. This is the previous Jesuit general, Peter Hans Kolvenbach. There is the present one. There is the Knight of Malta head, all of them subject. Here is Cardinal Egan kissing the ring of the Pope. He is, of course, the Archbishop always of New York. And the political and military powers of the nations are subject to these supermen who control the FBI, who control the CFR, who control the Bilderbergers, who control all of these. And this is not conjecture. This is not conspiracy. This is a plain fact. And he is the Pope a king. He certainly sits like one. There he sits on his throne with his close allies in black around him. And if you are a British queen, you have to come in black. And if you are an American president, you come in black. And your wife comes in black too. And you visit the boss. You stand in allegiance. The crowd gathered on the south lawn of the White House in Washington waved to Pope Benedict during an arrival ceremony Wednesday, April 16, 2008. He receives medals from the United States. The presidents, present and past presidents, kneel at the, at the ceremony of burial of the previous pope. And if you are a politician of note, you better stand side by side with the Archbishop of New York, who is the head of the Knights of Malta in the United States, subject to Friar Matthew, who is subject to the Pope. And whether you are a Clinton or whether you are a Bush, it doesn't make any difference whether you are a Republican or not. Hillary and Obama in secret Bilderberg rendezvous. And we know who founded the, the, the Bilderbergers, so we know who these people are subject to. And whether you have a good image in the world or whether you have a bad image in the world, like Hugo Chavez, president of Venezuela, you're subject to the same man. Good cop, bad cop, this is happening all over the world. Whether you are a preacher in America, it doesn't really matter. If you are a person of note, you better fall in line. This is Jeb Bush being made a fourth degree Knight of Columbus, a society steeped in Jesuit mystery. And here we have the previous presidential races, the Democrats and the Republicans standing before their cardinal. And uh, the one just after that, again, the same thing, the same Picture. He's always in the middle with the candidates on the side. These are signal pictures, whether we like it or not. And they're all related. Obama and his cousin, Senator McCain, shake hands at the roast dinner at the Cardinal Eden, looks on. Here you have Bush making the skull and bones sign before the priest as his cousin and wife, Laura, receives the black cross on her forehead. There's another skull and bones man. These people all belong to the same organizations. And if you want to know who controls the media, 
Chris Matthews, Pat Buchanan. Chris Matthew was a Holy Cross student. Holy Cross is controlled by the Jesuits, and Pat Buchanan was student at the Jesuit stronghold Georgetown University. Here you have Vincent Fox kissing the hand of Pope Paul II. This is the media moguls of the world. And if you want to know where their fingers and tentacles move and how they move the mindsets of men, well, then have a look at it. Martin Sheen, see you here in his visit to the Vatican. Mel Gibson, the passion of the Christ, receiving his honorary doctorate at Loyola Jesuit Marymount University. Father Bill Fulker, professor of ancient Mediterranean studies at Loyola Marymount University, translated Mel Gibson's film script for the Passion of the Christ into Aramaic and Latin and was the language coach for the actors on location in Italy. The script was written by Jesuits. Do they have the influence or don't they? Do they control the avenues and the echelons of power or don't they? This is not conjecture, this is fact. And if you are a king or a queen or a prince, you are just as subject as anyone else. Here you have Prince Albert bowing down and kissing the hand of the Pope. In 1989, the pontiff made Albert a knight in the Order of Malta. There's his Maltese cross. His medal can be seen on the center of his uniform. The same medals that even Napoleon wore and that Adolf Hitler used as his medals of honor. Isn't it interesting, this man was married recently to a beautiful South African lady, Protestant, but she had to convert to Catholicism in order to become his bride. And whether you are a King Juan Carlos, you will come to the Pope, you will kiss the ring, and you will liaise with the Jesuit generals. The kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. And even if you are an East Block man, the Mayi Emperor received the order of the Garter from Prince Arthur of Connaught in 1906 as a consequence of Anglo-Japanese alliance. The first member of the order admitted from Asia was Nasr al-Din Shah Qayyar, monarch of Persia. And today the emperors and currently Akito, the emperor of Japan, are orders of the Garter. These are all Roman Catholic orders. If you don't want to see it, you'll never see it then put your head in the sand and shout, conspiracy. Groombridge said in 1851 that Rome's pagan altars, pagan priests, pagan robes, pagan superstitions, pagan deities should pass for so many centuries under Christian names is altogether a mystery. How mysterious too is her influence. She has but to speak and she is at once obeyed. No place, no soil is free from her influence. In the cabinet of princes, in the temporary hovel, she can paralyze parliaments, break or elude laws, agitate kingdoms, sow discord amongst populations. Look at what she's doing now with the indignados and all these issues. Who's behind that? Mysterious are her weapons. Religion is her plea, but power is her aim. Mysterious are her movements. Her projects commence in mystery. How deep laid the scheme. I think he had it right. Mail Online. They're the Republican frontrunners for the White House, and Obama would be a fool to write them off. Let's have a look who these people are and where their allegiances lie. Once such a pure return, he won't touch coffee. Sounds like a bad thing not to drink coffee. The other's a hardline Christian who'd bomb Iran. Yesterday they became Republican front runners for the White House. Now I'm not concerned here with who's going to win the White House race because it doesn't make any difference. I'm not even concerned about these individual persons and their possible positions of power. 
I'm interested in the mindsets that they portray and who these people are that are pushed to the front of the echelons of power. Newt Gingrich, he didn't make it in the run, but he's a knight of Malta. And he was a powerful man as the speaker. And what about this man, Rick Santorum, late-breaking, game-changing, Rick Santorum is red-hot in Iowa. He also didn't make it. But his mindset is fascinating and his allegiances are fascinating. Where does he stand? And then there is the one who made it as the Republican candidate, Mitt Romney. A brash former senator for Pennsylvania, Santorum once condemned the Supreme Court decision to throw out a Texas law against sodomy. Defending the moral hard line, he said, if the Supreme Court says that you have the right to consensual sex within your home, then you have the right to bigamy, you have the right to polygamy, you have the right to incest, you have the right to adultery. He's got a point. You see, secularism has allowed the world to decline in morality. And the public voice is crying out for morality. Whose morality? Papal morality. And then you have the other issue. People are driven like sheep by fear of Muslim interventions and Sharia law. What would be better? Declare yourself a Christian nation and adopt Christian laws, then you cut off that avenue. But you sell your soul to the Pope? We have to demonstrate that we are family oriented people. And the Pope asks for a rediscovering of family values. 2012, the year of the family. We need good family values. And this is the picture that is being portrayed. Now, who are these people? Karen Santorum wrote a book about the experience, Letters to Gabriel, the true story of Gabriel Michael Santorum. And this is a sad story of this little boy. And uh, it does create the idea of family values and morality and all of these issues. I don't want to go into those details, but let's have a look at what he is and where, where he is. It says here, Santorum and his family usually attend Latin Mass at St. Catherine of Siena Church near Washington. Santorum and his wife were invested as knight and dame of magistral grace of the Knights of Malta. So then Maltese, Malta Knights. But more than that, Santorum traveled in 2002 to Rome to speak at a centenary celebration of the birth saint of Josa Maria Escreva, founder of Opus Dei. So this man, has links to Opus Dei. This man has links to the Knights of Malta. Roman Catholic organizations, if you belong to them, you are subject to the Pope. If you're an Opus Dei man, you wear a band around your leg or your arm that inflicts pain so that you will remember what your allegiance and your duty is and that you will give up your own personal thinking and be subject to that of your spiritual director. Senator McCain endorses Mitt Romney. We saw where he stood. Now Mitt Romney is a Mormon. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormonism, its founder Joseph Smith was a high-level Freemason. His successor Brigham Young was also another high Freemason according to the book Black Robe. Brigham Young was an intimate friend of Peter de Smet one of the most powerful American Jesuits of the 19th century. There you have another front organization. Joseph Smith writes in his own memoirs, in the evening I received the first degree in Freemasonry in the Nauvoo Lodge assembled in my general business office. I was with the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. So these are the founders. They have the same hand signals and secret handshakes and strange underwear and all kinds of things and aprons like masonry. 
This is Pierre Jean de Smet. Peter Jan de Smet was a Belgian Roman Catholic priest and member of the Society of Jesus, Jesuits. And Pastor Don Elmore wrote that Romney is a Freemason. This is interesting. He wrote here in February 2012, this pastor who researched this issue also said, Romney is a Freemason and a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Brigham Young, Smith's successor after he was murdered, came under the control of a Jesuit priest, Pierre Jan de Smet, who also controlled Albert Pike, a high-ranking member of Freemasonry. Brigham Young met Je Jesuit Pierre Jan de Smet near Council's Bluff in 1845, who told him to take his Mormon followers to Salt Lake City. And they received even political security. So these organizations are all linked to the Jesuits. Romney's connection to elitist organization, Bilderberg, Council on Foreign Relations, the Canadian Free Press, that should impress you, reported very revealing information on Romney's business connection with elitist organizations, including Bilderberg, Council of Foreign Relations, and the Trilateral Commission, and that was the web page. It appears this page has been removed from Canada Free Press sometime in November. They don't want you to know about that. But it was there. So these people belong to organizations that were founded by the Jesuits. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, I'm not going to give a Bible study on that in this, in this presentation. We've had that in the past. But the mark of the beast, Rome tells us that the mark of her ecclesiastical power is that she transferred the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And she claims that this shows her stature in the world and that she is above scripture. So when this mark is enforced, this moral entity, then we will have a situation where the power has been given unto that beast. Now the United States is supposed to be a lamb-like creature. But the Bible says she will speak like a dragon. And if the dragon gave Rome her power and authority and her seat, then how did Rome speak? She was always a power that enforced her dogmas through the political entities. And so the political power will yield to pressure from the religious movements and enact laws that will benefit Rome, the first beast that Wesley said was the Roman Catholic papacy, that Martin Luther said was the Roman Catholic papacy, that all the reformers said was the Roman Catholic papacy. But then America will have to change its stance. It cannot have a lamb-like constitution. It must be a constitution that can force people and even force the conscience, which is contrary to the Constitution. Well, it's a done deal. It has happened. Battlefield US. This is Russian television news. Americans face arrest as war criminals under army state law. Luke chapter 21 verse 26 says, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The final confrontation, I believe, is so close. Rome is gathering her forces. She's showing her strength. Her politicians, her front politicians, are making the right noises. Senate approves indefinite detention and torture of Americans. 
The terrifying legislation that allows for Americans to be arrested, detained, indefinitely tortured and interrogated without a charge or trial passed through the Senate on Thursday with an overwhelming support from 93% of lawmakers. You see, if you create an outside threat that appears large enough then people will give up their freedoms to counteract that supposed threat. And then you have them where you are. That's Hegelian dialectic. Did Obama sign a martial law executive order? As folks headed out to the happy hour last Friday evening, President Obama signed an executive order that could potentially give him the power to institute martial law in the United States in times of peace or during a national threat. This is incredible. It's over. The National Defense Resources Preparedness Executive Order will give Obama power over resources and services needed to support such plans and programs. Many Americans were shocked to find out that this order gives the president practically unlimited power over US citizens and, and their property. You will not be able to buy or sell. All in the name of national security, of course. In the order it states, in the event of a potential threat to the security of the United States, actions are necessary to ensure the availability of adequate resources and production capability, including services and critical technology for national defense requirements. And according to the White House release, the US must have an industrial and technological base capable of meeting national defense requirements and capable of contributing to the technological superiority of its national defense equipment. So things such as food, resources, livestock, distribution of farm equipment, commercial fertilizers, everything falls under his power. You will not be able to move without a thus says the president. So the table has been set. We are on the verge of these great events. And then the house passes a 662 billion defense act. The House passed a massive $662 billion Defense Act bill Wednesday night after last minute's changes placated the White House and ensured President Barack Obama's ability to prosecute terrorist suspects in the civilian justice system. I'm fascinated by this. Not only did this president meet with the president of France to discuss setting up a military power mechanism which would deal with revolution within their states. But they decided to work together on this initiative. This massive defense bill, which is the largest in the history of the United States, could be for internal use and for external use. I thought the Cold War was over. The war on terrorism is one, so they said. But here comes another policy. West's policy on Syria could ignite World War III. This is another Russian television newscast. The top Human Rights Council has appointed an investigator to probe human rights abuses in Syria, made public in the recently published UN report. And they're pushing for intervention. And the Council on Foreign Relations, this is their webpage, this is not conjecture, this is their own webpage, says time to attack Iran. Opponents of military action against Iran assume U.S. military strike would be far more dangerous than simply letting Tehran build a bomb. Not so, argues this former Pentagon defense planner. With a carefully designed strike, Washington could mitigate the costs or at least bring them down to a bearable level and spare the region and the world from an unacceptable threat. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and 
And Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz, I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, sir, you got to come in. you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> He said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. So go through the countries again. Well, starting with Iraq, then Syria and Lebanon, then Libya, then Somalia and Sudan, and then back to Iran. They have two agendas. And the two agendas are the following. They have to be able to take control of their own populations and remove dissenters out of the midst. Those executive orders are all in place. The second thing that they have to do is they have to set in motion those wheels that will fulfill, in adverted commas, their aspirations for their prophetic scenario in relationship to Israel. So they have to set up a quasi-armageddon, a harmageddon, so that that third temple can be built and people watch the fulfillment of their counterfeit fulfillment of prophecy on their television screens rather than preparing the heart for the coming of Christ. The choice, in actual fact, is between the morality as outlined by God in his word and the morality as outlined by the King of the North, the papacy. You're becoming a success between both nations, and as you were saying, certainly there are some regional implications there. But as we were talking about a few moments ago about a Wednesday's meeting of the Shanghai Co uh, Cooperation Organization in Kazakhstan, we did see a closer collaboration and big proposals put on the table between group members. Do you think it's possible that the SCO could become the economic mover and shaker of the world? I hope so and I believe so. Now, I believe the world is at the crossroad, historic crossroad, or some may say the world is at the brink of either being subdued or overcoming the U.S. NATO military intervention in Libya, now moving into possibly Syria, or even to Iran, if Russia, China, or these SCO, the, the alliance, are weak so that not enough to stop the U.S.-led NATO military aggression in North African region. So I, I hope so. The SCO, Russia, China, China, Russia leading, leading this new global movement to balance the power in the world so that they can build a new world order where no more unilateral aggressive or even colonial methodology being put into a sovereign nation such as Libya. Political scientist Dr. Kiel Chung, live from Beijing. Thanks very much. Russia and China warn America against Iran's strike as tensions rise ahead of damning atomic agency report. Fears mount that Iran could be nuclear ready in a matter of months. So here is a rhetoric. I'm not concerned as to whether this is going to happen now. I'm not a warmonger. I'm just telling you that the Bible says there will be turmoil at the end of time and that there will be legislation that enacts morality of the papacy 
and everything is in place, with even the papacy appearing in the United Nations and the European Superpowers Legislative Assembly saying, I am telling you how to legislate morality. And the United States, according to the prophecy, will play a principal part, and here she is doing it. And there's a warning from Russia and China, and of course, all the dispensationalists are saying, here we go, here we go. When is the rapture going to be? Was the nation of Israel raptured before the Exodus? Was it raptured before the plagues? No, and neither will the antitype. U.S. concerned Netanyahu may attack Iran. The United States is worried that Shaul Mufaz and his Kadima party joining a unity government with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu could result in an attack on Iran's nuclear facilities at any given moment, according to a report on Channel 10 News on Thursday. We are living in interesting times. And then Russian television says that the Pentagon is prepared to attack Iran, according to Panetta. Now, who's Panetta? He's the United States Secretary of Defense. Top Israeli officials have refused to meet the U.S. envoy to the P5 plus one group who arrived in Jerusalem with a report on recent talks with Iran. Here are possibilities that are fascinating. Panetta thus confirmed UN, U.S. Ambassador Dan Shapiro's comments on Israel Army Radio on May 17 that Washington has a military contingency plan in case diplom diplomatic talks fail to pressure Iran successfully. Shapiro said the option is not only fully available, but ready. Now a week on, Panetta said U.S. officials have plans to be able to implement any contingency we have to order in order to defend ourselves. However, Panetta said that the U.S. still hopes that the conflict of Iran's nuclear ambitions can be resolved diplomatically. So while they're focusing the attention of the Christian world on this possible biblical, in adverted commas, conflict there in the Middle East, they're quietly setting up the stage for what they will do to fulfill the true prophecies of the Bible. Daniel 12 verse 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. This scenario is complete for the fulfillment of this text. We are ready for a time of trouble such as never was. And in this chaos, Satan will try to divert the minds from the real issues allegiance to God and obedience to his commandments or obedience to the papacy and obedience to his commandments. The Bible says we do not be afraid regarding this conflict. It will be fierce. But it says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. This is the promise we cling to. This is the Advent promise. This is the Advent message. And this is my appeal. Keep the commandments of God and hold to the faith of Jesus. Amen. Amen.